There's nothing like the fellowship of those who love the Lord. So welcome to the family. There's always room for more. When I count my blessings, it's easy to see. My brothers and sisters, that mean so much to me. This is my 
chapter 11. I want to talk this morning about our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to speak on five benefits of a life of faith in Jesus Christ. A lot of people have faith. Uh, all religions have a faith. They exercise faith in something or some person. But the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is totally different than faith in somebody else. Uh, there's a group of people one time had faith in Jim Jones and David Koresh and and you can take uh, leaders of religions and they had faith that they were directing them right 
only to find out that that wasn't the case. Hebrews 11.6 tells us one of the reasons why it's very important to have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And we see, of course, if you have faith in God, the God of the Bible, you will, in fact, have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, his son, because uh, he wants people to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, give their life to Christ, his son. And it's just a foundational part of our lives. We're going to have faith in something. Back in the 29, 1929, early 30s, and uh, the Great Depression came into being, and many people lost everything. Some even were so despondent at losing all their financial income that they even took their own lives. Uh, they could not bear to consider a future without all that they had saved. And, and it is, is a tough loss. But it's important that you put your faith in the right thing. Uh, these, you'll have a lot of devastating setbacks in life. But as long as your faith is anchored in the Lord Jesus Christ, you make it through. You'll make it through. These other things will fail us. And we understand friends will fail you, your money will fail you, your position will fail you, and so on. You can lose everything. But boy, if you're anchored in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're a winner. You can't... You can't lose everything. As a matter of fact, you're going to gain far more than you ever lose. But uh, I want to speak about five benefits. There, what are the benefits of putting my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? Not trusting in some other person or some religion or finances or, or whatever or my own abilities and talents. Uh, what's the benefit of, of placing my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? But before we begin, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray you'll speak to our hearts today and encourage us, challenge us once again to really uh, make Jesus Christ the anchor of our faith. Uh, Lord, because it will get us through any storm of life that comes. And the storms are around us and could possibly even get worse. But Father, we need something that will keep us steady that will not allow us to sink, that will, give, that will cause us to give up hope. And so help us to be strong in our faith. Might we continue to grow in our faith? I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Back in 2012, if you were like me, I was watching television on a June evening, and I watched Nick Walinda of the Flying Walindas do something that I just, to be honest, I sat there in awe and watched as he had that cable stretched across Niagara Falls and said he's going to walk all the way across to Canada or Canada over the United States, forget which way he went, but uh, I sat there and watched that entire thing. I thought, man, that guy's got to, he's courageous. Uh, and then, after, of course, afterwards, you know, he's talking about how the updraft and and the spray that was in his eyes and all that, you know, is even greater difficulty than he had anticipated. Uh, but I also noticed, did you notice that if you watched that, while he was walking, he was praising the Lord. And he was actually praying and praising the Lord. The networks tried to cancel that out. They tried to shut off because they had a microphone attached to him. <laughs> and he was giving God the glory all while he was walking. I thought, well, praise the Lord. God's getting some glory out of this. But he wasn't the first to do that. Uh, there was a, a person by the name, and the a matter of fact, back in 1859, Charles Blondin, Blondin did walk across uh, Niagara Falls. Now, he didn't take the same course that uh, Melinda did, but he was incredible, this guy. Uh, and uh, when I did some research, matter of fact, I had to go to the fact and fiction and Snopes to find out this guy actually did what they said that he did. Um, he became the first man in history to walk a tightrope across Niagara Falls. Over 20,000 people gathered to watch him. 1,100 feet suspended on a tiny rope. 
160 feet above the raging waters, the report said. He wasn't harnessed with any safety harness or anything. Uh, and then he starts talking about his abilities. Uh, once he walked across on stilts. I thought, stilts? That's incredible. Another time he took a chair and a stove with him, sat down midway across and cooked an omelet. And he ate it out there. Once he carried his manager across riding piggyback. Once he pushed a wheelbarrow across with 350 pounds of cement in it. On another occasion, he asked the cheering spectators if they thought he could push a man across sitting in a wheel, you know, wheelbarrow. A mighty roar of approval arose from the crowd, spying a man, cheering loudly. He asked, sir, do you think I could safely carry you across in this wheelbarrow? Yes, of course. The great Blondin replied and said, get in. The man said, no, thank you. <laughs> now, there's one thing to believe in something. It's another thing to act upon it. And a lot of people believe in Jesus. Historians write about him. But there's a whole different paradigm when you trust him. And you really put your faith and believe in him. And belief includes all that. It includes trust and reliance, submission. But when you do, when you give your life to Jesus Christ and say, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, I believe he's the Savior of the world, and I believe that I can trust my soul and I can trust my life with him, there are benefits that come from it. Number one, faith in Jesus Christ will change your life for the better. It will change your life for the better. Acts 26, 18, the Apostle Paul is giving defense of his ministry. He's been arrested, and uh, he's saying, hey, I've got to tell you why I'm preaching Jesus Christ. Let me defend my ministry. And he tells about how he met Christ on the Damascus Road, how he was knocked to the ground, and how that Jesus Christ commissioned him to take the gospel wherever he could go to the Gentiles primarily. And in Acts chapter 26, verse 18, Paul says, my job is to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. He says, this is what God has commissioned me to do. I am to spend the rest of my life telling as many people as possible some important things. And this is what faith in Christ will do for them. It allows, number one, for a person to see their sinful condition. He says to open their eyes. Sinful man does not see how sinful they really are in, in, in the eyes of God. And so they're blinded to that. They really don't even look at themselves as sinners as such. They see weaknesses and shortcomings, but they don't see themselves alienated from God. They don't see themselves condemned by God. They don't even look at it like that. And so Paul says, part of my ministry is to open their eyes so that they can see themselves spiritually. And he says also to give them the desire for a life of righteousness rather than sinfulness. To turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God. Up until we're saved, we again do not realize this because spiritually we don't see life spiritually. We're serving Satan. Every person upon this planet is serving Satan. The power of Satan controls our life. And faith in Jesus Christ breaks that power. Now, the average person said, that's, that's ridiculous. I, I don't serve Satan. Yes, you do. Now, you don't say, I worship Satan. But what you do is you serve self. And self is controlled by Satan. That's why we have selfish desires. That's why we do the things that we enjoy. That's why so often we get ourselves in trouble because of our sinful desires. And so Paul says, 
part of my job is to do this exact thing, is to give them and, and place with them in them the desire for a life of righteousness rather than sinfulness. Turn from the, the power of Satan. You don't want to follow him. I was reading, maybe you have read too, in uh, Palmyra, it's over in Syria, it used to be a uh, temple to Baal. And um, that's what they worshiped back Old Testament time. <coughs> ISIS has destroyed that archaeological find. It'd be like going to Athens and you see all those wonders there. Those uh, archaeological stones and the Baal uh, arch and tower is still there in Palmyra. ISIS went in and destroyed it. Okay, well, this has set up a, a turmoil among uh, certain groups, UNESCO and uh, other people who are interested in uh, archaeological findings. So what are they going to do this month? We're going to establish in New York and Trafalgar Square in London an arch to bail and to commemorate what ISIS tore down that arch that was thousands of years old. Now, why would we do that? Why would we do that? Why would we set up and say, well, historically, we want to remember it because it's a historical symbol. They're going to set one up in New York, in London, at least a hundred other, other cities, and now they're talking about a thousand cities around the world. Why would we do that? I'm telling you, Satan is at work behind the scenes. So you'll read about it this month, when they, I think it's April 19th, uh, that this thing might be unveiled. And you think, what are we doing? Are we inviting Satan to have more control? Are we pushing God out and inviting him in? It's insane. But I'm, my point is, People don't realize it, but they serve Satan. And it's tragic. Paul also says it produces faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, a longing to have one's sins forgiven, that they may receive the forgiveness of sins. And certainly this is what happens when you give your life to Christ. You, God forgives you of your sins. That's wonderful. That's one of the great features about salvation and faith in Jesus Christ. Nobody else can do that. No other religion can offer that to you. No other faith in a person can offer it to you. I don't care. You name it. Nobody else can do that except Jesus Christ. Why? Because he died on the cross for your sins. He paid the debt. He took to see your sin and my sin upon himself. Nobody else has done that. One of the great benefits of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is that it changes our life for the better. We receive forgiveness of sin, we find favor with God, and we, we, we embrace these, uh, these great things that God wants to give us. Also, it automatically gives us an inheritance in heaven with other believers. Notice what it says, that they may receive an inheritance among them which are sanctified, how? By faith. And so we also get to enjoy heaven with other believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. What a great life that faith in Jesus Christ brings to an individual who, especially today, who live in uncertain times. Your new and improved life of faith will, may, will enable you to overcome the, and defeat Satan himself. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16, above all, taking the shield of faith, what will that do for me? Wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked or the wicked one. My faith in the Lord Jesus enables me to overcome the power of Satan. I'm not saying it's easy. He tries to find ways to defeat me all the time. He'll do the same thing with you. Uh, but with the shield of faith, if we take the shield of faith, anchor it in the right person, Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us that he enables us to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. 
Also, your improved life of faith in Jesus Christ will enable you to overcome the temptations of the world. We live with this all the, day, all the time. Temptations on every side. Uh, some uh, are overcome by it easier than others. But it's a constant battle in this life for the child of God to combat temptation. But notice what 1 John 5, 4 says. For whosoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. You see, it's our faith in Christ that enables us to overcome the world. It gives me an understanding of the world. It allows me to see what the world is doing. You see, again, the average unbeliever doesn't have any idea what the world is doing. I have a book that, uh, uh, that I read recently called The Marketing of Evil. Do you know that the world markets evil? Constantly. Hollywood markets evil. The music industry markets evil. Uh, all, industries are out there that do nothing but market evil. And the world doesn't see it. They don't have any idea. They just think this is the way it is. No. We're being sold it. No wonder the temptations hit us on every hand constantly. But the Bible tells me that even our faith gives me the victory. It allows me to overcome the world and the temptations of the world. Also, my faith allows me to enjoy the security of knowing that I'm going to heaven someday. For by grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourselves is the gift of God. My salvation is attained through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so one of the great benefits of faith in Christ Jesus, it'll change your life for the better if you will allow it to do that. You can overcome the powers of Satan. <clears throat> you can say no to Satan. You can say no to the temptations of the world. Uh, you can honor God. And your life, if we'll just follow your faith that's outlined in the scriptures, God will give you a much greater life. Secondly, a life of faith in Jesus Christ will also bring peace in the midst of the problem. <clears throat> peace in the midst of problems. The world wants peace. You'll hear this the rest of your life, and as long as this world goes on, people will always continue to cry out for peace. But there's never going to be any peace. In fact, one of the services I was talking the other day about, governments realize that for, for them to stay in power, there cannot be peace. There always has to be a conflict. There always has to be a war. There always has to be an enemy for the people to want government to protect them. So even though they put peace agreements together and uh, they spend all kinds of money and materials and paper and everything else to try to put the bed, a peace agreement together, there's never going to be peace. There's always going to be conflict. And I was pointing out that's why you have war on terror. That's why you have war on drugs. Everything's a war. Have you noticed that? Everything's a war. Uh, you know, there's a, you just name it. There's a war on it. <laughs> and, uh, and there always will be. So they can, they can say that we want peace and, and uh, all it takes is the next beauty pageant. And ma'am, what do we need most in the world? Well, we need world peace. Uh, you're the winner. You're the most beautiful and most knowledgeable and most intelligent. There's not going to be peace. <laughs> uh, there's always going to be a problem. But in Christ Jesus, you can have peace because it doesn't depend at all on the circumstances around you. You have peace at heart. That's what's great about it. Nobody else can give you that kind of peace. It's the peace in knowing everything's okay with you and God. And if everything's okay between you and God, you're in fine shape. Because you know where you're going and when you die. You know you have a heavenly father that loves you and cares for you. You know that God has forgiven you of your sins. Notice what Romans chapter 5 verse 1 says, Therefore being justified by faith, we have what? Peace with God. Through how? Our Lord Jesus Christ. Not anybody else. Not another religion of somebody. Not some psychologist who wrote this or that. 
We have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's wonderful to have peace. And so before we exercise in faith in Jesus Christ, we're really not compatible with God. We're really, there's a hostility exists between the lost and God Almighty. He's holy and he's righteous. As a lost person, we're wicked and selfish. And so there's this conflict. There's this hostility. The Bible says in Isaiah 57, 20, but the wicked are like the troubled sea, which cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. That's how God says, I see the wicked, the lost person. They're always troubled. Dirt and mire is always in there, always causing problems. Uh, they never find cleanliness. They never find peace. It goes ahead and says, Isaiah 57, 21, there is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. But faith in Jesus Christ provides you with the same peace that Jesus possesses. Jesus, I, when you give your life to me, I will give you peace. Now, my friend, listen, if we don't have peace, it's our fault. If you're a child of God and you don't have peace in the midst of problems, it's not God's fault, it's our fault. You know what the fault is? Our faith is just not strong enough. It's like the Bible, Jesus addressed the disciples, oh, ye of little faith. We just don't exercise the faith. I think of Linda walking across that uh, Niagara Falls. Now, he had faith, of course, in his own abilities and his talents. He had done it thousands and thousands of times before. But he also knows there is room for error. There's always room for error. But he also had faith in God. And we need that faith in God. If you're going to have peace, ultimately, it's going to come back to, God, I need you. I can do so much on my own, but I'm subject to error. The slightest slip up, the, anything. And I know that I can make that. And so God, ultimately, it goes back to you. God, I must put my faith and trust in you. And that's where God wants us to be. And if you'll do that, God will give you great peace. I don't care what happens to you. Uh, the banks can collapse, and my friend, we're not far from that happening. How are you going to respond when it does? Will it devastate you? Will your life be over? Or will you say, look to God and say, God, I'm looking to you. My expectation is from you. You're my safety. You're my rock of ages. You're my refuge. That's what God wants us to do in the midst of trials and disasters. Jesus says, peace I live, leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And so Jesus is the author of peace. And it's one of the greatest benefits you can have by placing your faith in Jesus Christ. He'll give you peace. And I can rest in him. Well, does that mean nothing bad is going to happen? No, bad things still going to happen. But you know he's in charge. He ultimately will take care of the matter. Matter you have to suffer some consequences. But it doesn't still make any difference. He is in charge. You trust him with everything. You give it to him and you rest in his decisions. And I'll tell you what, he can do wonders. But one of the great things that God can do that other people can't do is he can change people's hearts. You can't make somebody love you. People try it all the time. They try to buy their love. I'll just give them more presents. I'll try to flatter them. I'll try to do this and this and this and this. But basically, you can't control a person's love for you. Hugh Hefner was the Playboy guy. He says, I've never known what it is to be loved. He says, I know what it is to have people love me for my money, what I can do for them. But he says, if I could have one thing in life, it's to know that somebody really loved me for who I am. Well, I want you to know Jesus loves you. We teach our little kids downstairs, Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible tells me so. Every little kid ought to learn that little song in Sunday school. That's why Sunday school is so important. Uh, 
to, to children and to uh, even adults. But that's where we f get our foundation. That's why we see the benefits of our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He loves us and he will give us peace. Thirdly, a, faith, a life of faith in Jesus Christ will allow God to work miracles in your life. Nobody else can do this. No other religion can do this. Jesus is a miracle worker. In Matthew chapter 17, verse 18, and Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him. This little kid had been demon-possessed, and Jesus is casting the demon out of this little child. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him, and the child was cured that, from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could we not cast him out? And Jesus said unto him, Because of your unbelief. In other words, your lack of faith. For verily I say unto you, If you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. That statement comes about because it says of your faith, in Jesus Christ. He says, disciples, you couldn't cast the demon out because of your unbelief, your lack of faith. You see, the wonderful thing about faith in Jesus Christ is that he doesn't ask us to believe without proof. I listen to these humanists, evolutionists, and so on. They talk about science. You know, I've got to have science. I've got to see it. You believe you're, you're faith. You're just all faith. Yeah, but my faith is based upon something. It's not blind faith. Jesus never asked us to uh, utilize and act upon blind faith. Matter of fact, we believe, matter of fact, stronger than the scientists. I'm always amazed. Uh, you know, one time I was reading the Bible through and I'm thinking, I'm reading all these people, of course, you know, one after another. You can't pronounce their names. And then you go down through the cities, and you can't pronounce those names either. And I'm thinking, man, there must be a thousand cities or more in the Bible, most of them I can't pronounce, that every one of them is a chance for a mistake on God's part if that can be proven not to have existed. I think, why would the God put all of these cities in here that you don't even know that they exist or you can't even pronounce them and where are they and uh, their history? Why would God take the risk of putting thousands of names in there that every one of them could be a possible flaw if could be proven otherwise? But you know what? Science comes along and when they finally unearth a city, it's one that's in the Bible. It's already listed there. I was reading here just a few years ago. We don't even know. Science says we don't even know that David existed. And man, every, every kid knows, believes the Bible about David. Well, they finally found something that had King David's name on it. <gasps> We've known it forever. And so God doesn't say, I'm asking you to believe some fairy tale. No, he says, just look at the evidence. What is the evidence? Jesus came into this world just as he had been prophesied thousands of years earlier. I mean, it's all thousands of years ago it was predicted exactly how Jesus Christ would come in this earth. And when he arrived, he arrived exactly as had been predicted thousands of years earlier. Jesus was a miracle birth, born of a virgin. Nobody else has that happened to. That was predicted hundreds and hundreds of years before that ever happened to Jesus Christ. I mean, what's the chances? If you're looking at science, if you're looking at statistics, what's the chances? Well, it's an impossibility. But the, 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 uh, the evidence goes on. Jesus was miraculously protected during his early years and throughout his ministry. From the time he was born, Herod tried to kill him. Other people tried to kill him throughout his ministry. There was all kinds of plots against him, but they could not kill him because it was already predicted that he would die on a cross. 
It was impossible for anybody to, con uh, to kill him. Well, what, statistically, how, how could that possibly be? No, I'm just simply saying it's evidence again, over and over again, that what he says in the Bible is true. He did miracles that no other man could ever do or has ever done. The Bible is replete with miracles of all kinds. And people witnessed the, the miracles. They observed his miracles. They followed him because of his miracles. He says, what I've done, I'm not done in a corner. What I've done was out in the open. Nobody else. Why in the world would people doubt this? Jesus was very public with his ministry. Jesus was without sin. No other person can make that claim. But Jesus can. He says, find fault with me. Which of you convinces me of sin? Show me my sin. Nobody could show him of sin because he was without sin. He was God in the flesh. He died on the cross exactly as the prophets had predicted. You go to Psalm 22, you go to Isaiah 53, you go to other portions of the scripture, hundreds and hundreds of years earlier that talked about him being on the cross, crying out, I thirst. In other words, everything that was predicted about him came to pass. That, my friend, is not blind faith. Jesus rose from the dead exactly as he stated he would. I'll be in the grave three days, I'll rise. The scribes, the Pharisees, the chief priests believed it too, and they said, seal the tomb, Pilate. We can't let that guy out of there. They believed it. I mean, and he did. The tomb is empty today. Isn't that great? That's what's wonderful today. We serve a risen Savior today. He's no longer in the tomb. He's alive. Hundreds of witnesses attested to seeing him alive after the resurrection. We're not just talking about one or two disciples. Hundreds and hundreds of people saw him alive after his resurrection. Historians have written about the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no denying his existence. It's out there. Matter of fact, Jesus has had the greatest impact upon this world than any other person. Now, my point is this. Jesus is not saying, put blind faith in me. Look at the evidence. The evidence is all around you. Look at the heavens, the handiwork of God. Look at it. It all attests to the accuracy of God and God's word. And if you'll put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, God's son, he'll do wonders for you. He'll even do miracles for you. And so that's why placing your faith in Christ is different than placing your faith in any other person. The same Jesus who worked miracles when he walked this earth can work miracles in your life today. I like that. What moves Jesus to work miracles in your life? You know what causes Jesus to do a miracle in your life? Your faith. How much do you believe? In? You say, I believe in a lot. Do you really? Let me give you a test. He said, I really believe with all my heart in Jesus Christ. If you believe in Jesus Christ like you say you do, do you live for him like he asked you to? You said you believe in him. You believe his word. You believe all the evidence. Oh, I believe Jesus with all my heart and soul and mind. Do you? Do you live for him? How faithful are you? How's your giving? How's your church attendance? How's your witnessing? How's your saying no to fleshly habits? How's your living for Christ? Oh, well, uh, you know, you don't understand preaching. No. He says, disciples, you can't heal that guy because of your unbelief. You think you have faith. If you actually had faith, you'd get in the wheelbarrow, like the guy said. Well, you want me to take you across? Oh, God, I, I don't want to believe that much. Then don't expect miracles from God. He looked at that woman who had the issue of blood for 12 years, and she crawled up to it behind him and touched the hem of his garment. And he looked at her and he said, Thy faith hath made thee whole. She wasn't going to be stopped. Her faith, she had absolute faith that God would meet her need 
and she was willing to go through whatever insults and humiliation to crawl up to Jesus and try to stop the crowd and, and to seemingly be an embarrassment to the event. She didn't care about any of that. She just said, if I can but touch the hem of his garment, I can be made whole. God will do great things for us if we'll anchor our faith in Christ and then live like we believe. James 2.20 says, O vain man, faith without works is dead. And we can talk about our faith all we want, but the next time God wants you to be someplace, do something, act a certain way, and you don't do it, it shows our lack of faith. Mine too. This faith in Jesus Christ will offer us great benefits even to the point he'll do miracles for us. Jesus says if you have the faith of grain of mustard seed you shall say unto this mountain remove hence yonder and it shall remove and nothing shall be impossible unto you. What a great promise from a God who knows what he's writing but he says it's based upon our faith. Lastly the life of faith in Jesus Christ will glorify your heavenly Father. Having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, 1 Peter 2.12, that whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Your good works, what's he talking about? Your acts of faith. Why do I live a certain way? Why do you live a certain way? Because you believe God wants you to. You get to the point in Jesus Christ is your whole life is influenced by Christ himself. You live a certain way because that's the way he... See, he's living his life through us. That's why we live a certain way. In other words, when I do something and they behold my good works, they're simply beholding my acts of faith, my trust, my faith in the Christ and doing the things that I believe that he would want me to do. And in so doing those things, the Bible says that the Father is glorified. So faith in Jesus Christ in the Bible calls you and I to live a life that honors God, not ourselves. Let your light sh so shine before men. What's your light? It's your testimony of faith. It's, it's, your, it's your belief system in Jesus Christ. They see your lifestyle, how you handle situations how you respond to circumstances. They see all of this, and it all stems out of my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I'm to let that shine before men that they may see my good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And now the last one, number five. Finally, a life of faith in Jesus Christ will offer you a rewarding future. And that's, Quite honestly, as you get older, it starts looking pretty attractive. 2 Timothy 4, 6, Paul says, For I am now ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. I've fought a good fight. I've finished my course. And notice he says, I've kept the faith. As we start now saying, without faith, it's impossible to please God. God loves faith. That you simply see God, you've seen the Bible, you see the scriptures, you see the evidence, and by that you trust him and believe in him and believe in his son. And God says when you do that and you live a certain way because of your faith in Jesus Christ, that honors me. And because of that, I'm going to reward you. Paul says, I've kept the faith henceforth. And because of that, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. See, other religions may promise you many things. I'm amazed at what some other religions promise. <laughs> some of them so, so silly. My God promised me eternity with him. 
in a beautiful place called a city of Jerusalem, New Jerusalem. And so other religions, they're out there, but the promises are not worthy of our attention. Matter of fact, I wonder how they even know and can feel for sure that they would ever obtain that. Because they have their holy book. They open their holy book and it says, if you do this, uh, I will give you that. Anybody can do that. Anybody can write a holy book. And if you can sell it to people and they buy it and then you look in there and you say, when you die, I'll give you this, 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 this. But what's the evidence? How can you be sure? That's the wonderful thing about the Bible. The Bible gives you details about things that no one could give you details about. I mean, how would you know that there's a city made of gold? Why would he make a city of gold? Why would the streets be transparent gold? Uh, and he goes on and on about the beauties of heaven, how there's no more death, there's no more pain, there's no more sorrow, no more suffering. Why? How can I know that? Because Jesus Christ rose from the dead. He conquered death. He conquered pain. He conquered sorrow. He conquered crying. He, he offers a bright future now to the world. Nobody else can make that claim. Nobody else ever will make that claim. God gave us the Bible so that we might know something about heaven. He gave us the Bible so we know how to get to heaven. And I'm often amazed, too, how many people never look at their Bible to find out where they're even going when they die. And he gave us the Bible so we could have an anchor for our faith, which is in Jesus Christ. The Bible, I said once before, faith without works is dead. If you and I will exercise our faith daily, live for Jesus Christ like he wants us to live, he will do wonders for your life. You will have the very best life that you possibly could have, and then you will have a home in heaven someday. Won't that be wonderful? Stand with me, please. Welcome to the family. You can feel at home here. There's a lot of love that goes beyond these years. There's nothing like the fellowship of those who love the Lord. So welcome to the family. There's always room for more. When I count my blessings, it's easy to see. My brothers and sisters, that mean so much to me. I think about the many times they've kept me in their prayers. And the countless ways they've always shown me.
to Calvary And why was his life's blood shed just for me and why would he suffer like no other has done there's just one reason me. Mm-hmm. 